Welcome back, Myrmidons. This episode of Wonder Women of Greek Mythology Retold is all about Andromaca. Andromaca was the wife of Hector, heir apparent to the great city of Troy. Had the Trojan War gone differently and Troy emerged victorious, she and Hector would have ruled after Priam and Hecuba. In a previous podcast, I mentioned Dr. Emily Hauser's article in which she discusses how modern scholars and storytellers like myself piece together the stories of the female characters of myth. And by doing so, she says, we become, quote, direct participants in the classical past. I definitely feel that way as I research and write the Homeric Chronicles and put together the research for this podcast. The loudest heroines' voices are heard beyond the precious few lines that they're given by Homer. Andromaca, wife of the most famous Trojan warrior, was given 99 lines in the Iliad, according to Dr. Rebecca Muke, and her intimate conversations, meaning Andromaca's intimate conversations, with one of the primary heroic figures, her husband Hector, gives us, in my opinion, a very spectacular view into her life but also the lives of ancient women. Euripides' play Andromaca completes her story to its bittersweet end, but there is still so much left out in between Homer and Euripides. Artists and writers have been filling in that gap ever since, myself included. There are so many talented women right now writing and publishing about Greek mythology. It makes my heart just flutter. And I'm going to leave the links to their wonderful books and work in my show notes on my webpage and on my YouTube episode for Andromaca. What about Andromaca? She shares a very similar reputation to Penelope in that she is seen as a virtuous and loyal wife. Where they differ is in their circumstance. If you missed the episode on Penelope, here's a very brief recap. Penelope earned her reputation for loyalty in Odysseus's absence, far from the front lines of the Trojan War. I often think that Penelope is underestimated in her cunning. She kept Ithaca intact and as safe as possible from the suitors, kept her son Telemachus safe, and masterminded the weaving trick and the bow contest. Let's just acknowledge that it's remarkable Odysseus even had a home to come back to. Even in her final testing of Odysseus, by suggesting the marriage bed be moved into the hall, she continues right up to the end to show her sharp mind and her cunning. She had to persevere and struggle in a world literally dominated by dangerous and murderous men. She faced an impossible choice, remain under siege or marry one of the suitors. Not very good choices, right? Well, she was successful in the end, so you can take a listen to that podcast if you want to get the whole scoop on Penelope. Anyway, how does her counterpart fare, and what were her choices? Andromaca's reputation was earned at Hector's side during the entire Trojan War. She had a front row seat to the nine years of horrific fighting leading up to the Iliad, including the brutal end of her family and Hector at Achilles' hand. Surely, Hector had come home more than once covered in the dirt and gore of war. And when it was all over and Troy defeated, that's when Andromaca's suffering truly began. She literally lived the nightmare that Hector worried about if he should fall in battle. So part of Andromaca's virtue, and her fame, if you will, is that she was a mouthpiece for the plight of women in the ancient world, regardless of social status and wealth. All is not fair in love and war, because to the victor goes the spoils. In the ancient world, the spoils included the women of the enemy, wives, mothers, daughters. A quick death may have been kinder than the alternative of enduring life as a concubine or slave or being subjected to rape. So who was Andromaca? She wasn't a native Trojan. She was a princess from the south, the daughter of King Aetian of the Cilicians in Thebe. Her father was ally to Priam and Troy. It was customary for prospective suitors to bring gifts to the father of the woman that he had his eye on, 
fathers expected suitors to butter them up and prove they were worthy of their daughters. Maybe rich enough or politically connected enough to be of use in the future? A good marriage was one where both sides benefited. According to the Iliad, Book 22, 472, Hector pays King Aetian a handsome price for Andromache's hand in marriage. It reads, On that day when Hector of the Shining Helm led her out of the house of Aetian, when he gave countless gifts for her dowry. Now, that comes from Dr. Caroline Alexander's translation of the Iliad, which I'll be using for this entire podcast. So, King Aetian receives countless gifts for Andromache's dowry. I've also read that it was translated as princely amount. We don't have specific gifts that were detailed uh, for the dowry, but princely and countless, we can imagine that Hector wanted to make sure that he was the only suitor that King Aetian considered for his daughter Andromache, and thus Andromache was given to Hector in marriage. Hector obviously saw Andromache's worth as a woman and a potential queen. At the time of his proposal in marriage, the Trojan War wasn't even on the horizon. He would have been searching for someone who could handle becoming the Queen of Troy someday. If you listen to the Leda and Hecuba episode, you'll recall I laid out what I believe to be a very close relationship between Hector and his mother Hecuba. I'm sure Hector had a mental list of what he was looking for in a wife based on observing his mother. Being the queen of Troy was no easy task. One of the unusual things I stumbled across was this notion that Andromache wasn't a great beauty. If you've been listening to my podcast since the beginning, then you know I try to develop my characters based not just on mythological sources, but I also try envisioning these well-known figures as real people within an historical context. I really hope I'm doing them justice. Anyway, um, the oldest source I traced this idea that Andromache wasn't perhaps the greatest beauty was back to Ovid's Aris Amatoria in 2645, where he writes that Andromache was, quote, tall, but Hector thought her small, end quote. All right, the intimation was that others were critical of Andromache's looks, perhaps her height, maybe her size, and there may have been further editorial about sexual positions for a bigger woman, but that's not the point. What intrigued me was that Hector, the bravest of the Trojans, might have chosen a woman not just solely for her looks, but on how she intrigued him because of her morality or her intelligence or personality. This is the opposite of Helen, whose beauty overwhelmed men's better judgment. And it really puts into play a great juxtaposition between Hector and Paris by their choice for partner. Hector thoughtfully chooses a woman who would enhance Troy's reputation, while Paris chooses a woman who would eventually and literally bring the enemy to the gate. Here's how I handled the first meeting between Andromache and Hector in the Song of Sacrifice. Hector smiled at his hosts, King Yetian and Queen Mira of Thebe, who'd feasted him for three days straight. Maintaining a strong alliance in the south was of vital importance to Troy, but he tired of the noise and commotion. Hector's head ached from too much wine. The king had sent a number of beautiful women to his chamber every evening, yet tonight he dreaded more of the same, preferring solitude. Nodding to his host, he stood and dismissed himself. Instead of walking to his chamber, the prince made his way to the gardens. Ugh, peace. Near the center, a fountain trickled over a large basin. He found a nearby stone bench and sat. His back still ached from the long ride south. The sweet tones of flutes and lyres from the great hall carried softly on the night. Ah, peace at last. A footstep crunched on the gravel behind him. The hairs on Hector's neck prickled. Placing his hand on the hilt of his short sword, he said calmly over his shoulder, Approach and show yourself. Apologies, my lord. I thought I was alone. Hector turned where he sat. What are you doing by yourself, here in the dark? 
The woman stepped from behind the shadows into the light of the stars. She wore a purple hymation wrapped closely about her body, and her dark hair spilled over her shoulders. I could ask you the same, stranger. I'm a guest of the king. The king is kind. He turns away no beggars. Hector bristled. I am no beggar, my lady. The woman took a step forward. No, I can see now that you're not. I'm Prince Hector. Shouldn't you be in the hall? Isn't the feast in your honor? It is. Feasts are tiresome. I'd much rather be with the horses or training. But come, sit. Speak with me. Tell me your name. She approached, uncertain. Horses are magnificent creatures. The prince looked more closely at her. Yes, they are. She was ordinary compared to Briseis, but there was something about her. Her eyes spoke to him, her voice music in his ears. Forgive me for speaking plainly, my lady, but I find I can't take my eyes from you. The woman hugged her hymation closer, the light in her face dimmed. I'm no great beauty, my lord. It's unkind to mock me. Hector shook his head. I speak in all sincerity, my lady. You captivate me. I beg you, tell me your name. Tilting her chin up, she revealed, I'm Andromaca, daughter of King Yetian. Hector stood, horrified that he'd been so bold. Forgive me, princess. There's nothing to forgive, my lord. Andromaca turned to leave. Don't go, Andromaca. Stay. Speak with me. The night is yet young. Andromaca glanced at her feet. My father wouldn't approve of such a meeting with a man betrothed to someone else. I give you my word, my intentions are virtuous. Is that not what all men say? She smiled shyly. Good night, Hector, Prince of Troy, Breaker of Horses. Hector watched the Theban princess fade into the darkness. His heart was still pounding against his chest. He knew in that moment what he must do. As soon as Apollo's light broke a new morning, Hector sped on Ares for Troy. He took no proper leave of King Yetian, as his mind was bent on convincing his father to break the betrothal contract with King Brazus. For if he could not, Hector knew he would be a miserable man for the rest of his life. I'm not going to tell you who Hector was betrothed to or get into that. Maybe you've guessed already. But he was betrothed before Andromaca, at least in my series. Anyway, that would be a spoiler for the book, and I don't want to do that too. But he did break a marriage contract because he knew that he needed to marry Andromaca. What we know about Andromaca comes directly from her marriage to Hector. She's elevated in status, really, because of who he is. And like so many women, then and now, marriage becomes a way that they are defined wife of so-and-so, someone's better half, and that's making it nice, taking a man's last name and discarding your own, etc. Sometimes I wonder, you know, how dads feel when their daughters give up their maiden name. You know, is that a thing? Do dads feel bummed out about that? Do dads secretly wish daughters would keep their maiden name? I don't know, but it's just one of those historic things where women give up a piece of their identity that they don't even realize until later was a part of their identity. Anyway, marriage has also been seen as like a, a kind of ownership of a person. And in the ancient world, there was no doubt that it was the woman who was being owned. Now, I'm not saying marriage is bad. I'm just, all I'm getting at is that being married becomes for women more of a defining characteristic of her life than for a man. In Dr. Emily Wilson's December 2017 New Yorker article entitled A Translation's Reckoning with the Women of the Odyssey, she discusses how Penelope's experience of marriage is one of, quote, grief, abandonment, and loss of identity. And she goes on to discuss how Homer normalizes this experience for Penelope. Dr. Wilson also said of her translation that she really wanted to, quote, bring out both the beauty and the precision of the imagery and the horror, a common, relatable horror, of being a woman who experiences her attachment to her husband as the destruction of herself, end quote. And that really made me think about how marriage can potentially erase women in patriarchic societies, ancient or modern. Women around the world, just like Penelope, 
find themselves trapped by societal expectations, unwritten and written laws regarding their life choices. They find themselves sometimes trapped by familial ties and expectations and the requisite familial responsibilities of those ties as a wife, a mother, daughter, or sister. Although Dr. Wilson is focused on Penelope, because she's just translated the Odyssey after all, I find this concept that she's discussing very applicable to Andromache as well. We see it so clearly in Andromache's lament in Book 6. Hector is about to do battle again with the Greeks and is looking for Andromache and his son before he heads out of the city gates. He first goes to his house and halls, and when Andromache isn't there, he asks the maids if she went to one of his sister's or brother's homes or Athena's temple. Those are all places a woman should be, according to societal customs. But word Hector was heading out to battle had already passed through the city and reached Andromache, and she'd taken their son, asked the annex, and made a frantic dash to the rampart. I can imagine her fear. Hearing the news from someone else and not her husband set her into a panic mode. She was probably wondering why he hadn't come to her, if something significant had happened, and where he was headed to. We always imagine the fighting to be taking place just under the wall, but in the Iliad, we're nine years into the fighting, and it doesn't all unfold conveniently beneath the Trojan Wall. Anyway, Hector ran back to the wall and he found her, and here's the scene from Dr. Caroline Alexander's translation of the Iliad. This is from Book 6, Lines 399-431. to She met him then, and her attendant came with her. The child held against her breast, tender-hearted, just a baby, the cherished only child of Hector, beautiful like a star, whom Hector used to call Scamandrios, but all others as the Annex, lord of the city, for his father alone protected Ilion. And looking at his child in silence, Hector smiled, but Andromache came and stood close to him, shedding tears, and clung to him with her hand, and spoke to him, and said his name, Inhuman one, your strength will destroy you, and you take no pity on the child, the young one, or on me who have no future, who will soon be bereft of you. The Achaeans will soon kill you, the whole of them rushing to attack. And for me, it would be better, with you lost, to go down beneath the earth, for no other comfort will there be hereafter when you meet your fate but grief. I have no father or lady mother. It was godlike Achilles who slew my father when he sacked the well-established town of the Cilicians, high-gated Thebes, and killed Eetian. Yet he did not strip his body, for in his heart he thought it shameful, but he cremated him with his decorated war gear and heaped a burial mound over, and around it elms were grown by nymphs of the mountains, daughters of Zeus who wield the Aegeus, and they who were my seven brothers in our halls, they all on a single day entered the house of Hades, all of them swift-footed, godlike Achilles slew, as they watched over their shambling cattle and white sheep. And my mother, who was queen under the wooded Placos, when he led her here with the rest of his plunder, he set her free again, accepting untold ransom, and in the hall of her father, Artemis, who showers arrows, struck her down. Hector, so you are my father to me, an honored mother, and my brother, and you are my strong husband. So have pity now, and stay here by the ramparts. Do not make your child fatherless, your wife a widow. Station your men by the wild fig tree where the city is easiest to scale and the walls can be overrun. Three times they came there and tested it, the best men with the two Aeantus and illustrious Idomeneus, and with the sons of Atreus and Tydeus, daring son. Perhaps some seer, well-skilled, told them of it, or it was their own spirit that urged and compelled them. And great Hector of the shimmering helm answered her, Surely all these concern me too, my wife, but greatly I would dread what they would think, the Trojans and the Trojan women, with their trailing robes, if I, like a coward, should shrink away from the fighting. So clearly Andromache is upset about the impending battle. How many times has she farewelled Hector in the past nine years and waited for his safe return? Each time would be an agony, 
not knowing what is happening to your loved ones is a mental torture, isn't it? But a woman's role in the ancient world was to wait for word and pray to the gods and goddesses for the best. Unlike Penelope, who had one overly long and silent wait, Andromaca experienced Hector's multiple deployments. Ask any modern military spouse how hard it is to say goodbye, again, and wait, again. Andromaca shows us how difficult repeatedly saying goodbye is by her frantic dash for the wall as soon as she gets wind that Hector is leaving one more time knowing that each time might be his last. So she was quick to get there, and Hector was the one who had to double back to the wall. Hector just smiles at her and the baby because he knows. He knows how hard it is for her because it's hard for him as well. I get the feeling that in verbalizing her fears about Hector's potential doom and the bleak future for her and their son, should the unthinkable happen, that this is a conversation that she and Hector have had many times before. Because every time Hector deploys against the Greeks, he has to set his house in order. It's what soldiers do. And as the war drags on and on, the tensions ramp up and the stakes get higher. The Greeks aren't leaving and the Trojans aren't winning. Both sides at this point are wondering how much longer it can actually continue. Anyway, it's clear that her status or position in society was solely dependent on the survival of Hector and Troy. If Hector died and Troy survived, she would not have become queen. Ironically, Paris could have become king regent for Astyanax if one of his younger brothers didn't kill him off first and or usurp the throne for their children. We know Astyanax was a threat because the Greeks threw him from the wall to make sure that no male heir was left alive to revive the Trojan throne. Andromaca would have been helpless to stop any of this from happening by herself. She didn't even have a family to return to or to look to for support. They'd all been killed by Achilles. And with her mother dying soon after she'd been captured and ransomed, she really was alone. Hector was not only Troy's protector but Andromaca's as well. This makes me think of Outlander. Yes, not only do I love Game of Thrones, but I also love Outlander. All right, so Outlander is a woman who is from the um, 1940s era after the World War II, and she has fallen through a time portal in Scotland and finds herself uh, transported back to the 18th century. So that's her background. Anyway, so Claire finds herself in the unfamiliar and unfriendly uh, territory in the middle of the Mackenzie clan of 18th century Scotland. Jamie reassures her that she's safe as long as he's alive and around to protect her. Claire has no choice but to accept that offer, even though she doesn't know Jamie that well. She realizes that she needs physical protection against abuse or worse, rape. And women like Andromaca and Claire although separated by thousands of years in fiction, depended on a man for physical safety. And there's a reality for women, historically, for this to be a truth. A woman was lucky if her husband was as emotionally supportive and kind as Hector and Jamie seemed to be in their fictional worlds. Um, Andromaca's future, though, was uncertain if Hector were killed, uh, something that all women historically have really had to deal with. Despite her desperate pleas and reminders of all she's already lost, that he is her everything, Hector reminds her that he has to fight. If he doesn't, everyone will think that he's a coward. And he also shares his worries and concerns for her future as well if he should die. He mentions specifically that he worries about her having to work for some other woman doing some other woman's weaving. He conveniently sidesteps the very real possibility of her being forced to service her Greek master sexually by being forced to be a concubine or being raped. He doesn't put any of that to her, but they both have to know that that's a very real possibility. Honestly, I don't know why he would say any of this to her at this time. Uh, you know, at this moment that he's going off to fight, but he does say that. Then he scares Astyanax with this huge helmet, but that's another episode for the Superman of 
Greek mythology retold. All right, so, so so far we can see that Andromache's life more closely resembles a modern military spouse than Penelope's. In my Penelope episode, I shared that I identified my experience living in a military family with Penelope's because my father's service time on the USS Guardfish um, saw his multiple deployments. And when I was growing up, I just really identified with the waiting part of military life, that he was gone, come back, gone, wait some more, return. It felt like I was always waiting for my father to come home. I was young, and I didn't really understand that being on a submarine was actually dangerous. As a kid, I had the luxury of assuming that my father was coming back, something that grown-ups really can't afford to do. So what does Andromache do day to day while Hector comes and goes from war? Just like other women of her station, she was expected to run the household, raise children, and in her case, provide the heir to the Trojan throne and weave cloth. Her role as wife and mother not only defined her, but determined her daily tasks. We know from the timeline of Trojan War events um, in that episode that Hector and Andromache were married for some time before the Iliad began, and that they had only one child together named Astyanax. Book 6, 400 through 403 of the Iliad reads, Just a baby, and the cherished only child of Hector, beautiful like a star, whom Hector called Scamandrios, but all others called Astyanax, lord of the city, for his father alone protected Ilion. It's likely that Andromache had trouble conceiving and carrying children to term, or both. In the Homeric Chronicles, I developed a very complex relationship between Andromache and Hector that included the painful experience that a husband and wife share when they both want children but find they can't. In a household of childbearing women, Hector's sisters, Priam's harem, and the fertility of Queen Hecuba, it would have been painfully obvious that Andromache had an empty cradle and it was surely a source of constant heartbreak. Given the time period and what was at stake, Andromache must have worried that Hector would either give her up, choose a handmaiden as a surrogate, or take concubines to have children. All we have to do is look to her father-in-law, King Priam, to see what was accepted or expected in Troy. But we don't hear about Hector having bastards or harems. The Hecuba and Leda episode go into some detail about Hector's relationship with his mother and how that did shape him uh, as a husband. Here's a scene between Hector and Andromache from Rise of Princes, uh, book two of the Homeric Chronicles, tackling these ideas. Troy, 1249 BCE. Prince Hector paced the torchlit hall. Andromache's cries pierced the early morning darkness. His heart ached for her. I beg you, Apollo, let the child live. His wife had labored from morning to morning, and still there was no child. Finally, he collapsed into a chair outside the door that a servant had brought for him. My queen requests that you sit, my lord, the man had said. Hector had never known fear before, true fear, until Andromache's labor had begun. She had lost other children early in her condition, but had never carried one this far. If I should lose her. He'd seen the look of concern in the midwives' faces, concern they masked in the presence of his wife. If you gods are merciful. Andromache's voice silenced. The Prince of Troy held his breath, waiting for a child's cry. The silence stretched his nerves. He heard the torch flames licking at the dark. Hector stood, expectant and hopeful until Andromache's anguished wail shattered the moment. The midwife opened the heavy wooden door slowly, her face ashen and her eyes brimming with tears. She shook her head. My lord, she whispered hoarsely. The child. A familiar ache threatened to rip Hector's chest wide open. What? It was a son, my lord, she said quietly. He was beautiful. Perfect. Beyond the midwife, Hector could see his wife curled on her side. He knew she was weeping. Why, Apollo? Why do you punish us so? Can I see her? Will she speak with me? 
He remembered his mother weeping for endless days when Paris had been taken from her. He knew firsthand the depth of a mother's grief. His mother had never fully recovered, and he hoped his wife wouldn't fall to the same darkness. I believe so. The midwife's eyes were kind and warm. She dared to touch Hector's arm lightly. Speak softly, my lord. Her grief is coupled with great despair. She is my heart. I lay no blame at her feet. I didn't think you would, but she is not the only one who grieves. The woman stood aside, allowing Hector access to his wife. He rushed to Andromache's side, kneeling beside her bed. Gazing down at her, disheveled hair, he smoothed the damp lock from her pale cheek. My love, he whispered gently. Andromache turned her head toward his comforting voice. Hector saw the torment in her eyes and it pierced his soul. Why, Hector? What have I done that the gods punish us so? I have failed to give you a son. Again. My arms are empty. Again, and my heart is broken. Hector, I am worthless to you. Andromache wept into her shaking hands. I am worthless. Hector kissed her forehead. You are the sun to me, the sun that warms my heart. You will never be worthless in my eyes. She reached up, circling his neck with her aching arms, sobbing into his neck. You will take another wife now that I cannot give you an heir to Troy. Shah, Andromache, why would you think such a thing? I am not my father. For a moment, his mother's anguished cries echoed in his mind. I give you my word. I want to hold him, she cried. I, I do not think, I must, I must know the weight of him in my arms. She cupped a swollen breast with her hand. I will never suckle him, yet my breasts ache with his first milk. I beg you, bring him to me. Hector's eyes filled with tears. He looked to the midwife, his eyes rounded with fear. I beg you, gods, do not break her completely. Bring our son to us. The midwife ushered her attendants from the chamber before walking to the silent cradle far from Princess Andromache. Tenderly lifting the tiny bundle swaddled in royal purple, she cradled him in her arms as if he yet lived. She laid the baby in his mother's arms. My lord, lady, she choked. I will take my leave. Andromache brushed the child's cold cheek with a tender finger. Her tears fell freely, anointing him into the world with her grief. Her finger touched his chin. The king's mark and your dark curls. Hector smiled sadly. He is beautiful, my love. How can I protect her when the gods destroy her heart before my eyes? We will give him proper rights. Send his ashes to the stars and the moon, she whispered, so he will always be with us. I my love. Seleucus, the bright light of the stars. Hector kissed his wife's cheek and the crown of his departed son's black hair. Seleucus, another son for the gods. And that brings us to the rest of Andromache's domestic world. Book 22 of the Iliad gives us a glimpse of her household responsibilities and her skills as a weaver, probably an expert weaver. By the last part of book 22, Hector has been killed by Achilles, but Andromache hasn't heard the news yet. She's in their home, going about her daily life. This also testifies to the frequency of Hector's deployments. There is a feeling of routine about this passage. A routine disrupted by Hector's death. She was weaving at her loom in the corner of her high-roofed house, a crimson cloak of double thickness, and working intricate figures in it. She called through the house to her attendants with the lovely hair to set a great tripod over a fire so there would be a warm bath for Hector when he returned from battle. You see, Andromache is busy doing things. She's making a beautiful thick cloak, probably for Hector, and ordering slaves to boil water for Hector's bath when he returns from battle again. It's a scene that's likely happened over and over again. It's also what military spouses do when their partner is deployed. They keep busy and go about their day-to-day -day as if nothing unexpected will happen, spending emotional currency on the luxury of assumption, hoping through mundane chores to keep the fear at bay, planning for the homecoming.
When she hears the ritual morning voices rising in the air, she recognizes Queen Hecuba's above all the others. Fear immediately grips her, and she knows before she even gets to the wall what has happened. The nightmare she and Hector talked about in book six was just beginning. So speaking, she ran through the hall like a madwoman, her heart shaking, and her two maids ran with her. But when she reached the tower in the crowd of men, she stood on the wall, staring around her, and saw him, dragged before the city. Swift horses dragged him unconcernedly to the hollow ships of the Achaeans. Dark night descended over her eyes. She fell backward and breathed out her soul. Far from her head she flung her shining headdress, the diadem and cap and the braided binding and the veil which golden Aphrodite gave her on the day when Hector of the shimmering helm led her out of the house of Etienne when he gave her countless gifts for her dowry. In a throng around her stood her husband's sisters and his brother's wives who supported her among themselves as she was stricken to the point of death. But when she regained her breath and the strength in her breast was collected, with gulping sobs she spoke with the Trojan women. Hector, I am unlucky, for we both were born to one fate, you and Troy in the house of Priam, and I in Thebe, under forested Placos, in the house of Etienne, who reared me when I was still young. Ill-fated he, I of bitter fate. I wish that he had not begotten me. Now you go to the house of Hades in the depths of the earth, leaving me in shuddering grief, a widow in your house. The child is still only a baby, whom we bore, you and I, both ill-fated. You will be Hector, no help to him. Now you have died, nor he to you. For even if he escapes this war of the Achaeans and all its tears, there will always be for him pain and care hereafter. Other men will rob him of his land. The day of orphaning cuts a child off entirely from those his age. He is bent low in all things. His cheeks are tear-stained. In his neediness, the child approaches his father's companions. He tugs one by the cloak, another by the tunic, pitying him. One of them offers him a cup, and he moistens his lips, but he does not moisten his palate. But a child blessed with both parents will beat him away from the feast, striking him with hands, reviling him with abuse. Get away, your father does not dine with us. In crying, the boy comes up to his widowed mother, Astyanax, whom before on his father's knees used to eat only marrow and the rich fat of sheep. Then, when sleep took him and he left off his childish play, he would slumber in bed in his nurse's embrace, in his soft bedding, his heart filled with cherry thoughts. Now, now he will suffer many things, missing his dear father, Astyanax, lord of the city, whom the Trojan called by his name. For you alone, Hector, defended the gates and the long walls. Now beside the curved ships, away from your parents, the writhing worms devour you when the dogs have had enough of your naked body. Yet there are clothes laid aside in the house, finely woven, beautiful, fashioned by the hands of women. Now, now I will burn them all in a blazing fire, for they have no use to you. You are not wrapped in them. I will burn them to be an honor to you in the sight of the Trojan men and Trojan women. So she spoke, crying, and the women, in response, mourned. Andromache's grief is really compounded by Achilles' desecration of her husband's body. For not only does Achilles drag her husband in the front of the gates uh, before her, before all the Trojans, but the Greeks also pretty much Julius Caesared him. They John snowed him. Each Greek took turns stabbing Hector's dead body and joking that he was easy enough to defeat now, now that he was dead. And he wasn't nearly as terrifying as he'd been the day that he had destroyed the Greeks, the Greeks camp. So everything that Andromache has has feared, everything that Hector worried about has now come true. 
And Andromaca has nothing to do except for wait till the next shoe drops. Homer knew how to give us truly a tragic ending, and it was Euripides who softened the blow by adding the bitter sweet ending. Andromaca is eventually given to Neoptolemus, Achilles' son, as a war prize. And and Neoptolemus takes her back to Phythia. And life back there doesn't get any easier. The former Trojan princess is now a target of hate and murder by Hermione, who happens to be Helen and Menelaus' daughter. Neoptolemus eventually marries Hermione. It's a long story. I'll get more into that in another podcast. But um, Andromaca has to suffer through all of that. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens to Andromaca. If you've read Euripides, then you know. But I'm going to give you a couple of extra twists in my book. Anyway, that is another episode. So what are your thoughts about Andromaca? What do you think about her? How do you interpret her, see her different or the same as Penelope? If you'd like to know more about the Trojan War and Greek mythological characters and the chronology of the Trojan War and Greek myth, you might want to give episodes one through three a listen. And if you liked what you heard in this episode, try a few more. Leave a review on your favorite podcast format or a like, and just know that your feedback is greatly appreciated. As of now, I've hit over 11,000 downloads, and I am truly thankful for everything that you listeners are doing and for the feedback that I have. Um, Really, thank you as I sit here and do this podcast and It's sort of isolating, right? So you don't really know if anybody's truly listening or not. You just hope that they are. The downloads show that that they are, and the stars that um, you're giving me are showing me that you're listening. And I really do appreciate it. Anyway, I'd like to give a shout-out to my muses this time around. Uh, Dr. Emily Hauser, Dr. Rebecca Mug, Dr. Caroline Alexander, and Dr. Emily Wilson. Also to Dr. Diane Harris-Klein, who was one of my professors when I was in graduate school back in the day. And again, to Ryan Stitt at the Greek History Pod podcast. He is great, never fails uh, to provide great content on a Greek characters, Greek his- history. So give his podcast a try. Um, the Homeric Chronicle series is available wherever ebooks are sold and in paperback on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. All the applicable links are on my website. And just really thanks again for listening. Uh, that's it this time. So drink your wine and be merry, Myrmidons. Mm-hmm.